Heinrich Himmler was one of the most powerful men who ever lived. Yet he was not a boisterous warlord that you would see charging the enemy's sword in hand. He was quieter, meticulous, and dedicated to his chosen cause. To modern history, he's portrayed as unassuming and a small man in stature. Even an American intelligence report on him from 1943 did not even know how many brothers he had. And still today, many historians, documentaries, get their facts wrong about this man. But through his own detailed writings, and from those who actually knew him, interviewed by leading historians over the years, it's now possible to put together a different and more complete picture of the man Heinrich Himmler. Over the next many profile episodes, I will attempt to break down the misconceptions of Himmler and clear up others. In later episodes, I will try to do the same with many other leading figures of the Second World War, not with bias or judgment, but simply in search of who they were as human beings and of course seen within the historical context of the world we find them in, and guided by their own words and actions and reactions. Heinrich Himmler was born in the year 1900 in Bavaria. His father was Joseph Gebhard Himmler and his mother Anna Maria Augusta Heide. Both were by all accounts good church-going family folk and both Catholic and raised Himmler the same way. His father taught languages and eventually became headmaster of the prestigious Wittelbach School. And now despite what many sometimes would lead to the imagination of a strict Catholic teacher for a father, Himmler's father was very well liked by his pupils and he was a good caring father to all of his children, an understanding man as well but certainly one with principles, a pious man. He insisted Himmler write a diary every day, which he did his entire life. Himmler loved his parents and had a warm and loving relationship to them until their deaths. Himmler was always a good student and always showed a dedication to his studies. The family lived in Munich until Himmler was 13 years old, where the family moved to Landshut, a smaller suburb of Munich. The Himmler family had a long heritage, and later genealogists would claim to have traced their lineage back to a time before Charlemagne. Their family could be considered middle class, and some were consisting of butchers, businessmen, teachers, and police chiefs. Himmler was named after his godfather, Prince Heinrich of Bavaria, who attempted his baptism, accepting a formal invitation from Joseph. Generally, Himmler grew up in a financial stable and conservative family. He had two brothers, a younger and an older Gebhard. He would obtain a master's degree in agriculture. He would study Russian, take jiu-jitsu, and even fight a saber duel. And lose his first election due to his sense of humor. But we'll get to all of that soon enough. Himmler did always have poor eyesight, however. He always wore the small, round glasses we would always see him with in later life. However, he excelled in matters of learning and had a special interest in history and science. Even from a young age, Himmler traveled and studied historical locations with a keen interest. An interest in castles, religious, German past was something that later defined many of his actions and his impact on his SS. His diaries are full of descriptions of outings to old castles, battlefield, with his brothers and parents. Also, he would more and more make note of his readings that contained many historical books. The young Himmler was not as sickly as some have claimed, but initially Jim was not his strongest trait and as a child he was made fun of by other students for not being able to do a single chin-up. However, this was something he would dedicate a large part of his life to health and to fitness, and would improve his condition significantly. The dedication to fitness will be a recurring theme in Hindler's later SS, and he would himself, as Reichführer, work out and pass the physical requirement that he demanded of all of his SS men he would earn his fitness badge honestly. He was, however, initially a strong swimmer, 
and when asked as a teenager he wanted to become a naval officer. At the time, young Himmler had Jewish school friends, and later Non would recall any anti-Semitic feelings towards them at the time, and some of his childhood friends would remain friends with Himmler until the very end of the war, and with the end of his life in the hands of the British, and subsequently this spelt the end for many of his old friends. In 1945, it was not particularly safe to have been friends with Heinrich Himmler. His family was Catholic, conservative. However, one can imagine both the good and the bad that might come of being a son of a well-known school headmaster. But Himmler loved his parents, and would always carry great respect for them as well. Himmler joined the Catholic Church officially at age 13. Now, one thing that must be mentioned here. In 1980, a book was written called The Father of the Murderer, depicting a fictitious schoolmaster who sadistically terrorized his son and the other children in his class. It was supposed to depict Himmler's father, and it is even mandatory reading in some German schools today. It is, however, completely made up and was denounced by many of the pupils who were taught by Joseph Himmler. The former students revered their old teacher and referred to him as a pious gentleman. But you see, this is the problem we have when trying to depict many people of historical importance. We must wade through a pond of misinformation that truly hinders a full understanding of who these people were and thus historical events. But I digress. At the time the First World War broke out, Himmler was still only 13, but worked out and swam to improve his physical condition as many others of his age at the time. He had a sense of wanting to join the ranks of the fighting soldiers. All young boys then were full of the romantic notions war brings to young minds. So 1914 was an interesting year for the young Himmler. His parents would take him to Titemoing a Catholic town with a 13th century castle and an annual medieval jousting tournament and shows. Watching this would open Himmler's eyes even more to the historical aspect. Notes were made in his diary to this effect. Young Himmler now watching the armies mobilize as Germany had now declared war on Russia and later on France. He would write regularly in his diary detailed notes on the progress of the war, but also wondering how many of those who had left cheering may still be alive on this date. Himmler might have been a romantic young boy wishing for the glories of war, but he was not unrealistic of the death that came with it. Himmler's godfather fought a great victory around Metz in 1914, where he was wounded and had written Himmler's father of the ordeal. In his diary, young Himmler, he writes out the stories of the battles, the victories, and those exploits of his Bavarian crown prince. Tales of the battles, the war, troop movements, and sieges. However, in 1916, Prince Heinrich was killed on the Eastern Front by a sniper, deeply moving the Himmler family. As it usually is the case for many, during crisis and war, the Himmler family would intensify their religious devotions, and as war went on, he would often attend Mass, but take the time to learn to play the piano as well. He would play for his friends, and then they would play with their toy soldiers and trains. He was living the life of any normal young boy in a country at war, and at this time, where reports of victories came frequent, he would cheer on the soldiers pages of his diary. Throughout his early writings he displays his later trademark of slight pedantic attention to detail and proper titling of people as was customary at the time. The ladies are properly referred to by their husband's title and respectfully mentioned. Himmler would have an interesting lifelong respect for women, although one might later think he never quite understood the nuances of women. As the bad war news mixed with the good, the mood in the small town darkened. However, Himmler would not succumb to such. He watched the trains of the wounded, the enemy prisoners, enter and unload. He kept a written tally of the casualty figures in his diary 
updating them several times a day. Daily he would attend his daily devotions with his father, and with one eye on his studies and one on the war and on the news from the front, he would attend lectures given by soldiers of previous wars with France of 1870. More notes of patriotic fervor drifts into his writings now. He also works out with dumbbells every day to improve his physical strength in preparing for the day that he can finally join the military. By now he also reads Greek fluently and will later take up Russian. The family still found time for outings to ancient churches, but also he and his brother Gepard would visit old battlefields, walk the trenches and bunkers with great interest. Gepard, now 17, signed up for the military reserve and Himmler noted the event with jealousy. He did attend art exhibitions and concerts, but probably more to please his father's interest than those of his own. He would prefer the outings to ancient castles and monasteries. Ancient history was a lifelong fascination for him. He would read with keen interest of medieval religious persecutions and witch hunts, and he made notes of horror and interest. From Himmler's 15, his lifelong recurring stomach problems began, something that would sporadically haunt him for his whole life, and it is still unclear as to what have caused them. Himmler sought a naval commission in 1915, but was denied. He was still too young. And so again, 1917, he wrote and applied for a career as an army infantry officer. His father did, however, on his own, write the royal house asking to defer his young son's call-up until after he had graduated. Finally, in October 1917, Himmler was called to the colors, he left school and began his military training as a Fahne Junker with the 11th Bavarian Infantry Regiment Wandertan in Regensburg, and officially entered military service on January 1918. In June, he was sent to officer's cadet school and remained there until September, after which he was sent on to machine gunner's course. However, this is where Himmler found himself when the war ended. And as so many others, returned home and returned to school. However, many mainstream historians got it wrong when they noted Himmler did not go to war during World War I because he was too weak or sickly, as had been suggested. He was in military service. However, the war ended literally as he was preparing for the front. Still an interesting thought that the young Himmler at the time of the war's start was playing with tin soldiers and at its ending was in uniform firing heavy machine guns as an officer's cadet. Now millions of soldiers returned home to a country in chaos and they blamed the loss of the war to everybody and anybody. And certainly here, the first sprouts of the blaming assigned to the Jews and communists, stories young Himmler would have heard well. The First World War was a defining event for many of Himmler's later colleagues in the Nazi party, as indeed it was for most Germans and Austrians. German armies undefeated in the field, yet the Treaty of Versailles would make Germany pay reparations literally bankrupting her or what was left of her economy, leaving a general wish for revenge, making the next war near inevitable. The other defining event was the Russian Communist Revolution and its desire to spread, leaving active fighting in German streets. Battles between communists and nationalists would mark the next 15 years. Also, the shortages at home would see blame find their way to those seemingly having profited from the war and those eating while others went without food. Certainly, these events made impressions on the young Himmler. And over the war years, he too must have noticed that usually in hard times, farmers would usually have food on the table when those in cities were starving. And perhaps as a measure of future preservation, this might have been part of the reason he studied agriculture. But Germany was in turmoil. Food was now scarce, and with some support from Russia, German and Russian communists tried to spread a revolution throughout Germany, 
and with Prince Heinrich having been killed, the communists overthrew the Wittelbach monarchy in Bavaria and established a republic under Kurt Komorowski, also known as Kurt Eisner. In February, Eisner was shot and a new Soviet republic took over. Now this Bavarian government appealed for volunteers and Freikorps to fight the communists, and Heinrich Himmler appears to have volunteered as he returned to Munich for a time. Many of the veterans we would later see next to Himmler on the parade stands did the same. Himmler, Bormann, Röhm, and others decided all to fight against the communists who were determined to start a Russian-style revolution in Germany. But the struggle was not new. In the 1840s, socialists and democrats had also tried to take power in Germany by revolution, so the left-right struggle was not unknown. Himmler had been released from the army as an officer's cadet, thus not making him eligible for the now drastically reduced military, given the Treaty of Versailles limitations. And him having just missed seeing the front by a few weeks was something that would haunt him for years to come, as it would indeed for many others of the ranking members of the Nazi party, who themselves had just missed the call for various reasons. But so it was. And Himmler returned to school and finished his studies. He grew the short mustache. And this was for a particular reason. It had become an unspoken badge of honor for those who saw Western Front service as only a neatly trimmed mustache would fit under a gas mask. We would see Adolf Hitler wearing his for the rest of his life for this very reason. Of course, Hitler had survived gas attacks in the trenches, but Himmler had joined the soldiers' fraternities and was well received. Despite not having seen battle like many others around him, he enjoyed the conversations with the veterans and here met people who would eventually change history. In 1919, Himmler was 19. He had still never had a real girlfriend, but certainly mentions of the opposite sex in his writings, but he spent most of his time with higher education, and even members of the clergy. His uncle Karl was a priest at the beautiful church of Eisenstadt. Himmler would write of his respect for the Catholic Church, and it was not his choice to leave it eventually. At this point in life, Himmler never displayed much of an interest in politics, but this, as we know, would not last forever. And Bavaria, as much of Germany, was under constant unrest and saw the constant street battles between communists, socialists, the nationalists, Freikorps, while the socialist German government was under constant attack from all sides, seemingly unable to do anything about it. In 1919, after Eisner had been killed, another Russian-born communist, Evgeny Levin, proclaimed a Soviet Republic of Bavaria. He had argued for a German defeat and deliberately and openly argued for the Allies to humiliate Germany further by marching colonial troops to the streets. And indeed, colonial troops were occupying parts of Germany at this time. The German government ordered the army and Freikorps to suppress the coup. Levine and his men took hostages, scores of middle-class citizens, as well as members of the Thule Society by chance. They held up in Himmler's old gymnasium building, and every hour marched out two hostages and shot or beat them to death. When the army finally retook the buildings, all were shot out of hand, except Levine, who was shot by firing squad. But this must have made an impression on the young Himmler. He was not involved in the event, but with a Catholic and conservative upbringing, seeing foreign communists kill his hometown citizens in such ways must have made an impression. Himmler had now taken employment at a farm, but later fell ill with salmonella and was bedridden for a month. Thereafter, he transferred back to Munich and began his higher studies in agriculture and his brother Gephardt began studying mechanical engineering. They shared an apartment not far from the Polytechnic Institute. Himmler would study until 1922. They would visit their parents every weekend, and their mother would do their laundry. Himmler was frugal with his allowance and made careful notes of all of his expenses, especially outlining them in letters home when needing a little more money. Inflation was slowly making itself felt in Germany. 
given the time and situation, is was indeed not a bad idea to study farming. As Germany was seeing continued food shortages and inflation, it seemed a pragmatic study to undertake for an uncertain future. As Reichführer Himmler would later embark on farming projects, an experiment with plants for synthetic rubber production taken from the Soviet Union, and he would always enjoy the company of farmers and later speak repeatedly to farming communities during his years as a political speaker. Indeed, Himmler would later become Reich Propaganda Minister Deputy, a title he would hold until Joseph Goebbels finally took the position. Himmler was certainly interested in girls. He would take dancing lessons and enjoy their company, but still not having enjoyed the most private company of attractive female personnel, However, we do not have the impression that Himmler would sit idle by at any point. He would volunteer for everything he could, fraternities, the shooting clubs, alpine clubs, and of course much time spent with the 11th Infantry's Officers Association. One of Himmler's best friends were dating a young girl whom Himmler met and was quite intrigued and attracted to, but he behaved proper as one might say. To his diary he confessed to impure thoughts of the girl. Now the girls' names, such as Maya and Luisa, would appear, but confronted with a family of religious strictness and a future of a carefree, fraternal student life, he maintained cordial relations with both women, but he dove back into his studies. He noted in his diary in 1919, and I quote, Because it is my duty, I find peace in my work, and I work for my German ideal of womanhood, with whom I shall one day live my life and fight my battles, as a German in the East, far from my beloved Germany. So with some signs of being a hopeless romantic, the political events unfolding around him had not gone unnoticed, and one must say that at 19 it shows a remarkable foresight of things to come, as opposed to what should have been a randy 19-year-old student Himmler was satisfied with long walks arm-in-arm and the occasional goodnight kiss. He wrote of how, with Maya, he would stroll the streets hand-in-hand, attend plays, and visit her family, who approved of him also. They would kiss goodnight, share long talks, she would play the piano and sing. One night they attended a hypnotist that Himmler took an instant dislike to, referring to it all as a fraud. Unfortunately, his Maya was easily swayed to his dismay. Himmler would confess to his diary that he was not impressed by such black arts, and one may wonder what long-term impressions, psychics and readers, this have made on him. That Himmler's object of affection was center stage of such, at this point, it is clear he may be intrigued by witchcraft, but certainly does not believe in it. Yet these relationships ended, as such things do, and Himmler appeared downcast for a time. Still today, their theater ticket stubs are stuck in the pages of his diary from 1919. But now events indeed does lead Himmler back into the army uniform, patrolling the streets for unrest. He would spend much time talking with his parents of the future, both financially and of the country and his father, also a conservative, seemed to share many of Himmler's later political ideas and views. An interesting event in Himmler's life was when the Apollo University fraternity invited him to join. It was a nationalist fraternity to whom Kim Ludwig I of Bavaria had belonged, but this was a dueling society, something at odds with the Catholic Church, who clearly excommunicated its members for dueling. Himmler would confess to his diary that he would always remain true to the Catholic Church and protected when needed, but he was proud to become a member of the fraternity just the same. Of course, as it is with fraternities, they would drink, womanize, and would duel often. Himmler's stomach problems prohibited him from extensive drinking, but his fraternal brothers gave him a pass, and he found wine more agreeable to his constitution than beer. As for the womanizing, he had vowed to remain pure until marriage, and this much he told his brother. That left the dueling. For this he would risk being kicked out of the church. Now known that dueling is not always about defending hurt honor, his fraternity would duel constantly, 
and with other fraternities. And dueling with sabers was not about winning or losing as such. The contestants were covered and padded, but for their face, which remained exposed. It was about flinching, or rather not flinching, in the face of danger as sabers thrust. It was up to the audience to decide who stood the bravest. Himmler witnessed and seconded many duels before his own turn, and the scars was worn as a lifelong badge of honor. Many of Himmler's later colleagues would have great dueling scars. Otto Skosene and Kaltenbrunner comes to mind. Himmler does not drink, nor does he take drugs, but he does smoke cigarettes and an occasional cigar, another lifelong habit that would remain with him until the end. There are still not many hints of politics in Himmler's writings, yet when the student who shot the communist Eisner was sentenced to death, Himmler prepared to don his uniform with his brother and go to the jail to break him out. The sentence was, however, commuted almost immediately following massive demonstrations outside the courthouse, leaving Himmler a little annoyed that once again he did not get his desired fight, but the time for his duel was approaching. Still, Himmler was like any other young teenager, having fun with his friends, dancing with girls, boasting to his diary of much kissing. Far more time spent on that than on any politics in his writings at the time. But several parties are now mentioned. But on all accounts, he was a bright, upstanding young man. He wrote his parents twice a week, was dutifully honest and modest. He would, however, from time to time write home asking for a little more money, giving a full account of his expenses and expenditures, and that spring he would begin his training at a real farm. And he thought the world of the old farmer, Hemesterir, who recommended he also take classes in mechanics, which he did. He would plow the fields, feed the cattle, eat and drink wine with the farmers, go to the gym twice a week, and still take time to study chemistry and visits to the town. He had also begun singing in the church, and took it quite serious too, and I am guessing most of you did not know that at the age of twenty Himmler was a choir boy, literally. That autumn he returned to the Polytechnic to finish his studies. But Germany was in turmoil, inflation had begun, money was tighter. Now and his brother Gebhard had begun painting watercolors that Heinrich would sell for him. Gebhard had a new girlfriend with whom he was much smitten, and Himmler quietly enjoyed their happiness, commenting to his pages that hopefully he too would not one day fall in love and lose himself as his brother had. Over time he would, as sons usually do, write his mother more than his father. But as the economy worsened, Himmler had to ask his father for money slightly more often, but now, of course, always as then, still account in great detail for his economical situation and expenditures to his father. To his parents, he would never mention the fraternity or the duels he often witnessed, but to his diary he described them in great detail. But his parents, being Catholic, they would not have approved. He also constantly mused in his diary about traveling to foreign countries, Peru, Turkey, even Russia, and wondered what woman he would one day end up marrying. Yet determined to finish his education first, he had a quiet yearning for adventure, like most of that age would and will. But for now, he would be content to taking his girlfriends to the plays. Himmler seemed very contained within himself, and seemingly feared allowing his feelings to run away with him by falling in love, and allowing the physical relationships that sometimes run away with us all when we were younger. He held his mother in deep regard, and it seemed that reverence was transferred to all women. His diary contains many stories of how sorry he felt for young girls or waitresses in danger of being sucked into the physical primeval urges. Himmler was always focused on what he wanted to do in life, and he was waiting for marriage, in a most romanticized way, it seemed. In 1921, he wrote, and I quote, A decent man will love a woman who, through feminine wisdom and pure and childlike holiness, gives him strength to fight the hardest battles. And for the early 20th century, that's a nice romantic ideal that probably shared by some today. 
Although he could seem somewhat a little cynical about the other side of relationships and women, and having witnessed his best friends occasionally arguing with his emotional girlfriend and her subsequent crying her eyes out on Himmler's shoulders, seemed to have strengthened him in his resolve to avoid this particular fate, derailing him from wherever he was going. Although it cannot have been easy for any 22-year-old man, given the general hormonal drive towards the female of the species, so of the young Himmler must be said he had more self-discipline and self-control than I certainly did at his age. It is interesting that his reverence for women seems quite puritanical. He seems troubled by the naked form and disdains some cabarets with scantily clad dancers. He seemed to hint at a quiet wish to save girls. With the knight on the white horse symptom, he would write of this or that girl, hoping they would not succumb to so-and-so. And still later in life, in 1942, as chief of the German police, he orders his German police officers not to ask women if there had been actual penetrating sex while investigating sex crimes, as this sort of questioning appears, in his own words, as unworthy, and would even loudly and publicly scold his camp commanders if they used derogatory language about female prisoners, regardless of their religion, and this in spite of the fact that his orders may many times have brought these same females there in the first place. He would still dedicate himself to his studies, his training, with a sword for his duel. He also took jiu-jitsu and dance lessons, and worked out of the gym, of course, all to better himself. This is an image we most likely do not have of what we thought the young Heinrich Himmler would have been like at this age. Nor would we think of him as a prankster, but apparently he was, as he himself noted how he had clearly talked too much and cracked too many jokes, but could not help himself. It was said that this was the reason he did not win the election for student body president. With himself always talking and joking, he blamed himself. Also at the Apollo Dueling Society, they were not inclined to give him an officer's position, as they thought once his Catholic father would find out, he would make him resign anyway. Incidentally, the head of the Apollo was Jewish himself, but Himmler's diaries never show any particular anti-Semitism or interest here either way. But by now, he was beginning to find his own opinions about politics, about abortion, sterilization, and lamented procrastination amongst others around him, and had at this time begun to find even his best friend a little too liberal for him at this stage of his life. Yet at the officers' reunions he was treated with respect and conversed late into the night with matters of politics, war, and state. Here he felt at home, well among like-minded people. He was now making notes that he would like to learn more about the private industry, about banking, speculation, and wondered if money speculation was morally sound. Himmler was also inspired by talks given by the officers who fought in the East, wanting to defeat communism. He wrote to himself, and I quote, if another war comes in the East, I will be there. And as history would later prove, he would be indeed. It was during one of these meetings of old soldiers that his former commanding officer introduced the young Himmler to a veteran of the First World War, one that would change the course of his life, Ernst Röhm. Röhm was a decorated officer, wounded countless times, and one who had fought with the Fry Corps to oust the Soviet Republic from Munich. Röhm was by all accounts known to be homosexual, and it seemed it was not a secret. He was now, through his military connections, raising arms and weapons for the various paramilitary groups, and the government seemed to turn a blind eye. Röhm had joined the German Workers' Party as one of its earliest members, and in spite Himmler's intentions of becoming a caretaker of a large estate, which he was now trained for, Röhm talked him into joining his outfit. In the 1920s, Germany was divided, socialism and communism pulling in one direction and nationalists pulling in the other. 
And at this time, where Himmler was still writing home about his daily doings, asking for pocket money, and finishing his education, another war veteran had moved to Munich and settled there. He was older than Himmler and had been born not far from where Himmler had learned to harvest the fields. He never attended the fine schools or fought any duels. He, however, had fought the real war in the trenches, blinded by British gas attacks, wounded, decorated with the Iron Cross for bravery, and he had found himself in a hospital outside Berlin when the war ended. He was Adolf Hitler, another disillusioned soldier now searching for his cause. He was at the time unpolished and resentful of the politicians who in his mind had lost Germany the war, a sentiment shared by many of his other German soldiers. He had fought in the Freikorps against the extreme left and found himself supporting even the Soviet Republic of Bavaria for a short time. Hibler was demobilized in 1919 by the army but retained as an informant for the Bavarian authorities in order to spy on the various new parties. He also found the German Workers' Party and joined. Hitler spoke at his first public meeting in 1919, October 16th. He was a gifted orator, but until that first speech, no one had ever attributed anti-Semitism to anything he really ever said or wrote. Indeed, his commanding officer who recommended him for an Iron Cross was Jewish, Lieutenant Gutmann. An interesting note is that before World War II, Gutmann immigrated to America, where it was Hitler who personally intervened and made sure he continued to receive his pension. The first time we hear Hitler speak, he seems to have jumped on the popular notion that the Jews and socialists in Germany had lost them the war. Using the age-old political tactic, first identify an enemy, then promise to get rid of them. And in a beer hall full of disgruntled soldiers, one can imagine that went down like a house on fire. In 1922, Germany was now feeling the restrictions of the Treaty of Versailles. This gave Hitler more wind in his sails, blaming the Eastern Jews and Poles for profiting on starving German families, and the hyperinflation began to be felt in Germany. And now Hitler's star was on the rise. But Himmler was still far more concerned with his studies and preparing for his duel. He had always read a lot of books from different political and social standpoints, yet the following year of 1923 he began slowly to gravitate towards political studies and to race anthropology. He found the Aryan race theory appealing, and anti-Semitism and nationalism statements began to appear in his writings. Still his fraternity was the main part of his life, apart from his studies, he would spend much time with his older members, now established in business, visit those of them who were sick in hospitals, and began spending more time with his father, dining with him nearly every day. One summer day, he and his father went to a lecture in the large Circus Corner building. It was a political speech denouncing how the French would occupy the Rhineland and Saar region with 40,000 colonial troops, and the speaker spoke of the 800 mixed-race children this had now produced. One can imagine how the young, pure Himmler might have reacted to this, given his puritanical notions of women. And certainly the German newspapers wrote of this outrage and others committed by these troops. On one hand, Himmler does not write much about politics, but given his surroundings and friends, most of them veterans, nationalists, it is easy to see how he and many like him set off towards a wish to protect their country and culture from the presented enemies who were seemingly causing so much harm. One must wonder if this was a turning point in young Himmler's life. In his diary he hinted of being unimpressed and of bigger events and even of specific secrets, something unlike his previous writings at this point. Yet in June 1922, something did change his life. Remember, through history, most duels were not fatal. They were for the most part about restoring honor by drawing first blood. Fought with many different implements, of course, but in a fraternity, 
where there was no ill will towards opponents, and given the weekly dueling routine, death would have been a most undesirable outcome. Himmler's duel was with a straight saber, seconds watching closely, and nearby doctors standing by, a cheering crowd, and the sets can be as little as a few seconds, and some of them can last 20, 30, 40 sets. All who were there were unanimous that Himmler did not flinch, and received his coveted scar, nor did he flinch getting his five stitches. His rite of passage complete, he had reason to feel proud, and his father took it far better than expected. One might imagine he must have known it was coming, and given that his son was what we today could call a Class A student with no vices, one would suppose he could be allowed this one. His mother, however, took it less well, and also he was scorned by the family physician. However, a few days later, when he traveled to a party meeting in Munich, the new scar found him a different reception and respect. And despite us not knowing anything of the two men's interactions up until this point, or if they even had any, Hitler made arrangements for Himmler to have a place to stay, probably at the behest of Ernst Röhm. In 1922, the socialist foreign minister, Walter Radnau, was assassinated. The left took to the streets in protest, and the right rejoiced, as by them he was seen as one who had sold out Germany, and being Jewish, did not dim the sales among the nationalist organizations. At this time one must understand that anti-Semitism in Europe and in German-speaking states was not new. There had been laws expelling Jews from these ever since the 1400s. Even before the First World War in Russia, and after, Jews had been attacked and deported from the East as well. Hitler and the right-wing nationalists in Germany did not create anti-Semitism, but they certainly rode the wave and used it for propaganda and would continue to do so until the end. The killer was arrested, talks of a plot was mentioned, even in Himmler's diary there was an odd note as to the identity of the plotters, but without explanation it's hard to guess or speculate if Himmler at this early stage had had any involvement or knowledge of these events. However, it's clear that many of those who signed the World War I armistice were sooner or later murdered, and Radnau was one of them. However, from this, inflation doubled and tripled, and this continued out of control. In Bavaria, the nationalists were in control and staged a large peaceful demonstration of over 60,000 people. Socialists who wanted to disrupt the demonstration, but the police kept them at bay. In July 1922, Himmler passed his final exam, and his days in school were done. Leaving with the BSc in agriculture, for the next year he would work as a lab assistant at Nitrogenland in Munich, a fertilizer factory. He would eventually leave this employment with a praising testimonial for its director, citing him well-versed in office work, agriculture, and forestry. It is an interesting note that during the war, the correspondence between Himmler and Oswald Pohl, after Pohl had citing I.G. Farben's findings, Himmler noticed how well aware he was of the misrepresentations of businesses dealing with fertilizer. At this time, Himmler may probably never have met Hitler in person, nor had begun to see him as the man to follow. The party was slowly being armed by his friend Ernst Röhm, who was still an army officer, while at the same time Hitler and his NSDAP were courting German businesses for financial support to buy arms, something which they received. All groups, both in Bavaria and the rest of the country, saw the violent overthrow of the government as the preferred way of change. However, Hitler's NSDAP was growing with new supporters, and from 1923, it seems mentions of them and Hitler began to appear in his writings more often. In 1923, when the French occupied the German industrial area of the Ruhr, due to Germany not being able to pay the exuberant reparations imposed on her by the Treaty of Versailles, that really gave wind in the sails of the German nationalist movement. An act of sabotage began as well. As the government contemplated military action against the French, 
Even the British complained about their former French allies. The German army began to train with Hitler's Sturmabteilung. Hitler appointed Hermann Göring a commander of the SA, and at this point Göring also created a new unit, called the Stabswachter, in charge of Hitler's security. These adopted the Prussian Hussars traditional death's head emblem, which we will later see on the SS uniform in a slightly different form. At this time, it is still unclear if Himmler had actually met Hitler in person. We do know Hitler's jeweler met him in 1922, but the time of their first meeting is still not recorded for history. However, the German government and General Hans von Secht was indecisive and concluded they could do nothing about the French occupation. The nationalists blamed the socialists and the government, and the NSDAP's newspaper blamed the Jewish influence, and Berlin government, sensing the growing popularity of these sentiments and that of Hitler's growing popularity himself, banned him from public speaking and the publication of their newspaper. However, in Bavaria, the government refused to comply. Smart enough to know, it has never historically worked out well to ban charismatic speakers from speaking, and probably because they were rather sympathetic to his cause as well. Back in Landshut, Himmler joined an organization of farmers, the Anthem League, promoting peasant warrior values, which appealed greatly to Himmler himself, who always did like farmers and their common-sense viewpoints of life. Their slogan was Blood and Soil. An essay written by Himmler cites the farmers as the backbone of the country whose enemies must be Jewish capitalists and Marxists. And from this, we can now conclude that Himmler had begun to tie together in his mind the Jewish community with socialists, Marxists, and the pressing danger to Germany. Now Himmler still, consciously of having missed the fighting at the front of the Great War, signs up for a number of right-wing groups seemingly to ensure he would not be on the sidelines once the inevitable marching and fighting would begin. Thus he came in contact with World War I veteran George Strasser, a Landshut pharmacist, a great organizer and orator, an agitator like Hitler, he had set up a Sturmabteilung in Lower Bavaria. Himmler had also rejoined the regular army in 1923, and he joined Strasser's SA the same year. One of the key events was the May Day Parade in Munich 1923. Certainly nor Hitler or Strasser nor Göring was about to sit still, watching the hammer and sickle being paraded around by German communists. The word came down, that now it was time. Arms were expected to arrive along with the army to support them, and after successfully banishing the Reds, they would proceed to stage a coup. Hitler, the political leader, Lieutenant Colonel Krebel in charge of the army, Erich von Ludendorff, the World War I hero, to take charge of the operation, Strasse along with Himmler as his adjutant, and 3,000 men, they marched on Munich as did Hitler and Göring with their men. Here they all awaited the arrival of the army. Yet after much waiting in the sun, the 20,000 men finally saw the army arrive, led by Ernst Röhm, but flanked by the police. Röhm told Hitler, no certain terms, that this was not the day for a coup, and General von Lassow also refused to have the promised arms released to Hitler's men. Strasser would later dismiss it all as a dress rehearsal, but seeing the May Day Communist Parade go unmolested must still have been a slap in the face of Hitler and his men. In 1923, Himmler became involved in publishing. He teamed up with Arnold Ruge, banned from teaching in Heidelberg for his protests against the Jewish influence on teaching in Germany. Together they obtained the Munich publishing house. Ruge did serve a year in prison, and until 1936, where Himmler commissioned him to publish a series of books on the medieval witchcraft trials, not much more is known about him. In 1923, August 1, Himmler joined Hitler's party, the NSDAP, membership number 42,404. He also mustered with the 1st Battalion of the 19th Infantry, preparing for active service. 
a real possibility now that communists had taken over Saxony and Thuringia and now threatened with a new Soviet Republic-style takeover. At this time, it was a year after Mussolini had taken power in Italy. Hitler was still fighting in the German regions for a way to power. He began to unite the different groups, calling the Bavarian police and the Reichwehr to march on Berlin and evict the Jewish leadership, as he styled it. On September 25th, he addressed the heads of his new coalition, and here we find Himmler's first notation of the two men's meeting. Hitler called for military character and discipline and unconditional loyalty and obedience, and that its men turn up for service regularly, and junior members to be appointed by Hitler himself. Himmler noted especially they swore a personal oath to Hitler, and he made the following four notes after their meeting. Armed struggle, power, Hitler, Wolkische movement, and Großdeutschland. The French invasion into the Ruhr was a great pretext for calls for immediate action. Hitler's followers wanted to march on Berlin and overthrow the government, and Hitler's backers wanted a regime change. In fact, the one thing all fractions on the right would agree on was a regime change to the right had to happen. How to go about it was a slightly different problem. The army secretly began to train the Sturmabteilung, not just for border patrolling, but also fast-paced attacks towards the north, i.e. Berlin. Despite the disagreements in the ranks, Hitler decided to take the risk and prepare his forces to converge on Berlin. Those leaders on the Reich who did not support this was temporarily locked up in the Burgerbrau, beer keller. General Ludendorff arrived, Röhm arrived, with Himmler and his brother Gepard. Röhm and his fighting men received the orders for taking over the telegraph office, the railroad stations, and the march. Himmler carried a red-white standard of the imperial battle flag, banned after Versailles. Röhm and his men easily took over the war ministry buildings. Hitler easily convinced the army cadets to join him and General Ludendorff's side, issuing swastika armbands, proclaiming that a new nationalist government had been formed with the army on its side. An interesting note is that despite the constant use of anti-Jewish sentiment and blame for Germany's difficulties when it came to actively perpetrating violence against the Jewish businesses during this uprising, Hitler forbade it, and would even fire his own intelligence chief, Hoffmann, for outrages against a Jewish business as he would later testify. Goering ordered the bridges taken only for his men to find the police already there, to counter them. Three of Hitler's supporters had denounced the coup, and as soon the army and police marching on Hitler and Röhm's men, the coup began to unravel. Still despite, the cause seemed lost. General Ludendorff would still march his men to aid Hitler. He would not, in his own words, be a scoundrel and leave a comrade in the lurch. And certainly marching behind the regimental banners, singing the national anthem, they were led past the first police barricades. Ludendorff enjoyed great respect, but this is as far as it went. Gebhard Himmler reported to Röhm in the war ministry building that things looked bad. At this time, a young female student witnessed a young Heinrich Himmler standing outside the front of the building, a weapon slung over his shoulder, and holding the Reich flag in one hand, it was Himmler who had found his cause, and displayed it proudly, a cause of greater Germany, and one he would never divert from until his death. But the war minister and Ka had let them down. Despite promises of support, and in later episodes we can go into detail of the well-known ending of the failed coup attempt. Despite allowing the marchers led by Ludendorff and Hitler to pass several police cordons, finally they were stopped by three lines of police officers, rifles at their ready, armored cars, and soon they opened fire on those marching. A man fell dead, dragging Hitler down, others wounded. The police seemed to target the leaders and deliberately finishing off even wounded marchers as they were laying on the ground. Röhm and Himmler attempted to negotiate a truth, 
however outnumbered by military police, talks were futile. Some slinkered away best as they could into the darkness, however Röhm and many others were arrested. Two days after the failed Munich Putsch, Hitler was arrested. Röhm was awaiting trial, and Himmler being a junior figure, no fallout whatsoever, and not mentioned in any of the trial transcripts. Göring, who had been shot during the Putsch, had fled and spent a lot of time recuperating from his wounds. Over the following year, Himmler was without job the paper having been banned, and he spent his time following up on contacts and leads from work. But also kept in contact with old comrades, and from time to time made mention of Hitler's speeches in high regard. An interesting point of Himmler's was that he still went to church regularly, attended confessionals, but his diaries full of signs of his curiosity of Aryan history, the relationship between men and women, he read books on witch trials, and with horror of the sexual exploitation of young girls by priests in past centuries. Also of the fundamental questions of life. Carefully he would note all books he read, as well as his regular excursions to ancient sites. With less frequency at this time, he would find time to visit Ernst Röhm in prison several times bring him fruits and newspapers, and would spend hours there talking about the political situation. But at this time, one thing occupied his mind, his older brother's relationship with the attractive Paula Stolza. Daughter of a banker in Weilhelm, his brother had a good job and they were happy. Himmler told himself it was of pure idealistic protection for his brother's best interest that he warned him after having discovered that his classy girlfriend did have a past, one that did not sit well with Himmler, nor would it their parents. The young Himmler undertook a profound campaign to break up the couple, citing how his brother was too good for her, and how she had an immoral past, and apparently was no longer a virgin, and despite her being twenty-four, this could be a valid point in a puritanical mindset and given Himmler had maintained to remain true until marriage himself, there might have been a slight jealousy in his efforts to derail an otherwise happy couple. Sure, Himmler himself must have had urges being in his prime age. It's hard to speculate on the motivations of a person one have never met. One hand, Himmler is outgoing, funny, and well-meaning at this point, However, there's confused side to him as it came to the opposite sex, the kind of insecurity and romantically idealism young men and women many times have before encountering their first relationship of sex, love, and heartbreak. As a student of psychology, I can't help but, given what I have read, to think that Himmler was probably asking out of honorable motivations, as he had no desire for Paula himself, and he was actually taking the risk of a lawsuit of slander even then. In Himmler's mind, she was a loose woman, who had far too much fun. She had done nothing that would raise an eyebrow in the 21st century, but did there and then. And despite Geppert's trying to initially shrug off the rumors and the proof of Paula's past, he would eventually cave in and break off the relationships. Today it seems petty and credulous about the campaign Himmler waged to get rid of Paula. Still, his diary is full of exceptions. Should a young lady have been led astray, he would feel sorry for her and blame it on the man or the circumstance, such as, and I quote, being Jewish. Despite so-and-so being of such and such a lovely girl, past references from the past year, there did seem to be a savior complex in young Himmler. But here he could not save the poor girl in question, he most certainly could save his brother from such a troubled girl. However, Himmler continued to seek refuge in more visits to ancient historical locations, Roman settlements such as Epfach, with his fortress ruins dating back to the Romans. Hitler received a light sentence and stood up for his patriotic motives of the trial, certainly those powers that be had sympathies for him, and the movement, as did the judge. Also in prison was he well cared for, and very well visited. Ludendorff would visit him in prison often, as would Röhm. 
who now took charge of the entire SA. Not Hitler's wish, however, he was in prison, and Röhm had been released with a suspended sentence and ran for office. Hitler had many prominent visitors, including wealthy investors, who stood ready with finances, as did some German industries and industrialists, and despite the failed coup, Hitler's popularity did not vane, and a new Mercedes sports car awaited him upon release. Himmler was not among the over 500 visitors. However, in 1924, he himself began a public speaking on behalf of the right-wing group, the Volkischer Block. Starting with his first public speech in Bamberg, a town which had expelled its Jewish inhabitants as late as 1919, incidentally. He spoke of communists, improvised farmers, workers' issues, a speech he noted bordered on national Bolshevism. And as time went on, he became an accomplished speaker. Despite post-war, we have heard practically none of his speeches. This year, Hitler was released from prison, publishing his book Mein Kampf, a book many historians have now come to regard as mostly not written by Hitler himself, but by Hess and other supporters in prison with him. And it would take the young Himmler several years longer before he got around to reading it. Throughout life, Himmler was always very particular and detail-oriented. In his early diaries, as well as the later-in-life ones, as head of the Gestapo and the SS, he made meticulous notes of detail. Earlier, he made notes of every book he had read, and even its page count. And, as people are today a product of the information they see on modern media, and the opinions of the circle of their friends, so was Himmler certainly impressed by the anti-Jewish sentiments expressed around him for years. From the 1920s, his readings began to focus more and more on the origins of the animosity towards Jews. It would be fair to deduct from Himmler's reading and opinion slowly emerging in the pages that he associated Judaism as a source of drugs, pornography, and immorality, Books like The Sin Against Blood by Arthur Didna and books by Bradley Smith figured with underlined passages in his early readings, while at the same time his interests in ancient Germanic pasts and possible origins more and more intrigued him and filled his studies. One can already hear, see, from where the inspiration for his future SS archaeologist corps, the Enneneb, began at an early age. And once, with full resources and manpower to indulge his lifelong fascination with history and the Germanic past. A passage in Himmler's diary he underlined as the most important book I ever read, end quote. Race Teachings and the Germans, by Hans K. Gunther. It spoke of northernization and the controlled breeding and eugenics. It outlined the Nordic people's qualities as truthful, excellent, with a strong sense of justice and controlled sexuality. This must have been an interesting read for a man trained in agriculture. The thought that despite the impure blood that had influenced the German race for centuries, it would be possible to rebreed the Nordic race back, Himmler would write. And now we can begin to see his future path. Along with authors such as books by Felix Dunn that warned of a future of ethnic mixing, it is clear that the young Himmler was beginning to find beliefs in the romantic Nordic ideal of the warrior race. To Himmler, it was not later an election ploy, but it seemed the actual foundation for what he believed. In his mind, wishing to see women through a veil of purity and romantic notions, he did the same for the Nordic people of Germany. Himmler was finding his cause, and his cause was now calling him as his mentor, George Strasse, who had also survived the putsch. He had actually been arrested and sentenced to jail, however. As he had also run for parliament and won, he was let off, as members of government was automatically granted immunity. Just like today, being a politician, I suppose have its benefits, and Strasse needed the young, hard-working Himmler. 
as he was running to enter the Berlin Parliament and had recognized Himmler's talent for bureaucracy and organization, and hired him on as a personal assistant. Himmler was paid 120 marks a month at the age of 23. Not much. But Himmler knew the value of loyalty and hard work, even then. And soon Strasser appointed him as deputy Gauleiter of Lower Bavaria. And he became the Gauss SS commander also, and took up a leading position in the Autumn League, taking no time for girlfriends. His reputation grew as he always went a step further and diligently performed his tasks. The true Himmler was finding himself then, and he found his inner bureaucrat as well. Now there was no more time for private things. Himmler ran the office, reminding members of everything from missing dues to paperwork requests and his own requests for various documentation, friendly, meticulous, yet firm. And as the election date neared, Himmler would race all across the countryside on an old motorcycle from speaking engagement to speaking engagement. With the main themes being how Jews, Freemasons, speculators had brought Germany to his knees and the results spoke for themselves. On December 7, 1924, Strasse would be elected to the Reichstag in Berlin, as would Röhm and Ludendorff, all due to the efforts of the German Volkische Freiheitspartei. Thus Strasse, thus Himmler, down the ladder. So now Strasse began his move of his power base and focus up north to Berlin leaving Himmler in charge with more authority than he might have imagined less than just a year before, as he was then penniless window shopping after the failed putsch. It was a good month for the nationalists. A few days later, Hitler was released from prison. Also, the two men now certainly was well aware of each other, but hardly figured on each other's horizon. Something I personally find a little bewildering is how little mention there is of Hitler's and Himmler's diaries and writings at the time. Even Gebhardt post-war told investigators that Hitler was somewhat of an unknown to Himmler, yet when he had written of him, it was glowing, acknowledging him as the future leader. And Himmler could have gone to prison for Hitler's putsch, although he seemed at the time more seeking the right cause than the man, and he was still a closer friend to Röhm. So one could say, if Himmler had been the opportunist some had later claimed, and had recognized who was going to be in the high chair, why would he not have ingratiated himself with Hitler while he was in prison and seemingly down? Himmler was his own man, of opinion and of belief. He was inspired by some, but not easily led by others. He was not unintelligent, or would fall for swindlers easy. He would rally and fight for a leader if he found one who preached what Himmler had come to believe. And in the coming years he certainly found Hitler to fulfill that role. And certainly Himmler was loyal in his service. But initially Himmler did not seem to follow Hitler because he needed a leader figure. He believed in the ideals Hitler claimed to profess to. And Himmler would in time begin to improve on these with his own initiatives in the years to come with its own terrible consequences. Then and now one senses how most politicians will say and do just about anything to win vote. Promises and virtue signaling is what it has always been about in the Game of Thrones, and one can always say the same for Hitler. On the campaign trail, he would blast the Jews, while in private would praise Jewish artists. And after becoming chancellor, there seemed to be little dedicated anti-Semitic movement deriving from his initiatives. However, with Himmler and Goebbels and Bormann, there appeared to be a genuine and clinical belief that the Jewish influence was destroying the fabric and moral of German society, and in their own right take initiatives against the Jews in Germany and later in German-occupied territories. The young Himmler was a bureaucrat on a mission, fitting his own beliefs. He would lead those serving him, and serve those above him, but never stray from what he himself deemed to be correct and proper, finding solutions and clinical solutions and numbers, 
drawing from his earlier interest in ancient history and readings, it can, with some justification of the two men, be said that Hitler was an opportunist while Himmler was an idealist. But this at a historical time where terms all turn grey sooner or later. But that was all for the future. Now Hitler had come out of prison a reformed man. No longer a wish for violent armed revolution, he came out a politician, dedicated to revamping the party and winning elections above board. This did not sit well with some of his more radical henchmen, nor did it with Röhm. As commander of the SA, he wanted the organization to remain independent, while Hitler wanted it under the now-reformed party. But despite going clean and attaining the powers in Germany legally through elections, not wishing for more bar brawls or fighting in the streets, Hitler knew that at the time even legitimate politicians would face trouble fighting in the streets, and in 1925, on April 1st, he established a new bodyguard unit, one that would be unconditionally loyal to himself. Initially, the unit was only eight men strong under the command of Julius Schreck and consisted of men like Rudolf Hess, Emil Moïse, and Sepp Dietrich. Ernst Röhm would soon leave the SA, thereafter the party and the country. He would, however, remain in contact with Himmler during his time away in Bolivia, and Strasse would rise amongst the ranks, as would Himmler, who now became a national orator for the party and deputy to Strasse, as Gauleiter. Even his parents again enjoyed seeing him clean-cut, now with an energized purpose in life, starched shirts and ties. Himmler had been searching, as young men do, for a battle to join, and here he had found one, one behind a desk or a podium, and with his panache for detail would write constant streams of letters reminding members of dues, speaker's appointments, smaller details, something he would continue to do and would eventually rejoin the party in 1925 in August with the unimpressive party number of 14,303. In November that year, on the anniversary of the failed putsch, Hitler would announce the formation of the Schutzstaffel. On this day, from now marked in the calendar with celebrations of the new Nazi martyrs who died on this day, for a short while the SS was led by Schreck. But he was soon voted out of office and replaced by Josef Berthold, a tobacconist who had proved himself a street fighter. Later Schreck would die from meningitis, something that deeply affected Hitler, and one of his earliest closest friends, Himmler would in later years refer to Schreck as Hitler's SS member number one. Himmler did not apply for membership in the SS straight away. He did not like or trust Bertolt, and he had been a party secretary, now a position taken over by Xavier Swartz, a man Himmler absolutely could not stand. We now begin to see the internal party politics enter the picture. It was not until August 1926 Himmler signed on to the SS, membership 168, and paid 13 Reichmarks for his uniform, and for the first time donned the black cap with the death's head emblem upon it. The party had moved its headquarters into a somewhat empty building in Munich's university district. One Himmler knew well. Strasse had moved to Berlin and opened a publishing company with his brother Otto. Hitler had made Strasse Reich Propagandaleiter, making Himmler the deputy Reich Propaganda chief, a title he would hold until 1930. Now already at this point, however, it seems that Strasse had begun to veer away from the party line, giving his publications seemingly more leftist. However, Himmler clearly saw the writing on the wall, and for him, Hitler was the man to follow. So he moved from Landshut back to Munich, and took up an office in the back of the building. From here he would direct his campaign for the next year and a half, and he shared a room with the widow Mathilde von Schobenrechter. Her husband had marched arm in arm with Hitler on that day, and been killed right next to him, pulling him down, landing across Hitler possibly shielding him from further bullets. 
Hitler had given her a job, building a library of precision research. Thus she would spend many days reminiscing with Himmler about the events of that day. As Reich Deputy Propaganda Minister, it is clear from Himmler's correspondence, since he would always initial all his letters read, that he was receiving volumes from around the world voicing their concern as to the Jewish influence in politics, in economics, the rise of communism. This must certainly have solidified his conceptions that he was not alone in his concerns. And his speeches from 1926 reflect this as well as the dangers of spreading socialism to the German people. He would speak of capitalism versus socialism. He voiced worry about the lack of honesty among people who worried more about the money than they might have to merit their worth. In a speech in October in Berlin, he would voice the dangers that Germany had no space to breed and one day would have to burst. And should this not possibly result in a war where a million would die, might this not be worth it? For the greater nation might survive and grow. Certainly it was the stated goal of the NSDAP to rid Germany of its Jewish population. As years to come would show, it was the difference in methods that would come to decide the lives and deaths of millions of people. In late 1936, Hitler, having lost Röhm, appointed Fratz Pfeffer von Salomon as commander of the SA. He was a former career officer and former Freikorps commander. Hitler directed him that the SA was not to be a rival to the regular army. They should not focus on weapons training, but fitness, boxing, and jiu-jitsu. He wanted an aura of legitimacy for the SA and for the party. Later, it would prove that Salomon was not uh, the same ideas and he had some of his own, but for now he went along with Hitler's directives. The SS was established as part of the SA under Bertolt and now betitled as Reich für SS. The SS was under Salomon's direct command, but under the overall command of Bertolt. It was in 1927 among his many speaking engagements, then a dark fate fell upon the young Himmler. He met a woman, an older woman too, Marga Siegroth, daughter of a landowner near Bromberg. She was in the middle of a divorce from a childless marriage and co-owner of a medical clinic in Berlin. It is a little unclear as to how they actually did meet, but much of their early correspondence exists and her first letters to him addressed Dear Herr Himmler, and his response to her was a letter full of party political pamphlets. Certainly a romantic start if I have ever heard of one. But Himmler was young and busy, constantly speaking, traveling, late nights writing letters and replying to others. It was not on his horizon to begin a relationship. However, it seemed it certainly was on hers. She had no children, being seven years older than him, and soon to be divorced. From her letters it seemed she was the interested pursuing party, doing her best in a formal way to entice him to visit her in Berlin. Himmler was still only a lower-ranking member of the party, one most people would not have heard of. Just working his way up the greasy pole, one must wonder why her gaze befell on him, as indeed it seemed to have done. One must initially think from their letters. He merely corresponded with her as he would with all others who wrote his office. However, she was persistent and showed interest in the party, his work. She was constantly asking when he would visit her in Berlin, and after twenty more speaking engagements, he did. And they did. And the pure Heine was no more. He was now a man. A troubled man. As he related to Otto Strasse a few days after his rendezvous with Magda, he was a guilt-ridden man. He had committed an immoral act and was deeply troubled by this. This sort of casual liaison went against his morals and values, as he now saw only one way out of this moral dilemma. 
he had to marry her, as she had given herself to him. Though it seemed rather clear this was the desired outcome she had wished for. And upon announcing his intention, despite warnings from his friends, and much of the rolling of eyeballs of all around him, this is what Himmler saw as the only option. He wrote himself, I quote, I would rather empty a beer hall of a thousand communists by myself. And nothing would make this easy. She was a divorcee, at the time not a favorable option for a young man to marry. And what was worse, she was a Protestant, something his parents would absolutely not approve of. And certainly the Catholic Church would not either. They excommunicated him. And certainly, as expected, his parents were not happy for her at all. And she, in turn, did never warm to them either. She would do her best in her writings to extradite Himmler away from Lensut with guilt and charm, but certainly there were many loving letters amongst those hundreds preserved still. Himmler always had a warm relationship with his parents, yet this was heartbreaking moment for his mother. She was distraught and left no question about the fact that Himmler tried to oil the waters between them and Magda, but to no avail. She was equally as uncompromising, writing him, Darling, I cannot believe you would allow anybody to interfere with our affairs. I will certainly not. And Himmler's stomach pains began again. She also began questioning the amount of time he spent with the party, slowly demanding more time for herself, thus attempting to insert herself between the two pillars of Himmler's existence, his parents and the party he lived to serve. As Himmler's brothers later tell us, the family did not warm to her at all. She was demanding and unfriendly, and the few letters her family did write to her went unanswered. And on her insistence, he rarely took her to visit his parents. The wedding date was set for mid-1928. No photos really exists of this, but one was found which clearly shows what a fun day he must have had. She would eventually sell her half of the clinic to her partner and spend the money on a small house for them six miles from Munich. The house had four rooms, two stories, and a large backyard just big enough for a dozen chickens. In this house they would remain throughout their approaching depression. In 1928, they would marry in July, twice, once at the registrar's office in a civil ceremony and one at the Protestant church. Her brother and father acted as witnesses, while Himmler's entire family stayed away. It was the same month Himmler finally read Hitler's book, and underlined several passages of importance. He would make a small note citing, Education of the SS and the SA. He underlined passages noting the dangers of race mixing and the inequality of the races, Hitler's warning against multicultural societies, but as Himmler noted, these could be unmixed. Back at his peaceful office, Himmler, as Tass's deputy, must have viewed the division of direction with some concern. Gregor and his brother Otto was leaning left, determined anti-capitalists and with a growing movement, while Hitler saw it differently. Of course leaning right, but saw the distinct need to win over the German industrialists and their money. Hitler also insisted on the sanctity of the army, while Pfeffer saw the SA brown shirts eventually taking over that role. Himmler flew under this conflict's radar and quietly made his plans and waited. Certainly he was developing a political instinct and slowly built up his network, bearing his time. In 1927, Berthold had resigned as SS Eisleiter, and the position was now filled by Bernhard Heide, and Hitler nominated Himmler as his deputy. However, Himmler and Heide shared a vision of the dedicated elite SS men. As Himmler noted, the world's eyes are upon the men of the SS, yet they should not be noticed, yet watch and listen, but not speak. And indeed, this is how the men of the SS attended the SA meetings, quietly, not smoking, not drinking, and sitting on the back rows. Starting in 1927, with the black cap and tie, 
to the entire black outfit uniform in 1932. Now, in truth, is that for Himmler, it was a rather meaningless title given the SS strength still numbered under 300. But Himmler set about this task immediately. Directive after directive went out to the SS units and commanders. Everything from a new uniform, policies, directions, explicitly directing new recruits to only be of the highest quality. Men should only be brought in if they were of the highest moral standards and of no reproach, and dedicated to National Socialism as a lifelong way of life. Men to whom an expulsion or resignation from the SS would seem unthinkable. However, Strasse and his focus elsewhere and his absence in Berlin, having slowly begun to neglect his duties in Munich, and materials and speakers' requests for the local elections were now demanded from young Himmler. More and more of the regional party leadership were disaffected by the centralization of the leadership and found it harder to obtain materials and speakers for their own election campaigns. Thus, more and more important requests would land on his desk, and he was slowly seen as the man to go to in order to get things done of this nature. Also, incidentally, around this time, the political police in Munich began to make notes about the young Himmler and his doings. Many of these were wrong, and guesswork, but still, figured on their radar from 1927 and onwards. Until this point, history tells very little of the relationship between Hitler and Himmler, or of the communications between them. It seems like any other typical, organically grown relationship between two people in the same organization, Hitler appoints Himmler to be the second in command of the SS, at a time in history where no much have been said of the two men. But certainly Hitler must have noticed Himmler's dedication to his work, and the party's movement as a whole, possibly also due to the fact that Himmler, despite his recent dueling scar, can hardly be called an essay pugilist. And this might have also appealed to the reformed Hitler wishing for all the legalities to be upheld in the party's new campaigning for power. Himmler's full-time job is working for the party, and his income in 1928 is only about 1,800 Reichmark, not a vast sum by any means. He and Marge live sparsely on the low income, and with the global economic collapse soon to come, they only just weather the storm through this frugality. It is often mistakenly said that Himmler was a chicken farmer, he was not. The couple had a backyard just big enough to have a vegetable garden, a handful of rabbits and a dozen chickens, something most people would have at this time if it was at all possible for them to do so, and something during the Depression where money deflated and food was sparse might certainly have helped the couple through. Now especially important as Marga had become pregnant. Neither Himmler's colleagues warmed particularly to her, and she did indeed not show much interest in them. To them, the marriage did not make much sense at all. She never mentioned Hitler, was not particularly fond of Ludendorff, and would voice as much. But their letters were caring, naughty hints here and there, but over a short time became dull and domestic, and what magic there might have been seemed to have become a domestic routine. Now in 1929, a small, insignificant opposition slanders article led us to meet the final evolution into the Heinrich Himmler as we know of him today, Reich für SS. Erhard Heide, the actual head of the SS, was a business-minded man who ran a small mail-order business on the side. To this, Hitler had given the sole contract to provide all SS and SA uniforms. And equipment. Now, the Münchner Post, a left wing paper, published an article saying Jews as Hitler's suppliers. The mail order company had apparently purchased goods from a Jewish company and also fiddled the books a bit, both towards the party and the tax collector. And Haida handed in his resignation and sued the paper for defamation. He would years later turn up dead, floating in a lake. So it was, on January 6, 1929, Hitler 
appointed Heinrich Himmler as Reichsführer SS, a title he would hold practically until his untimely death at the hands of the British in 1945. This was the milestone in Himmler's life. Granted, the NSDAP was not a large party, nor was it by any means certain that they would ever gain power in Germany. But Himmler now set about reforming and creating the SS, and at the end of 1929 it reached a thousand men, but only hand-picked and the very best of recruits. And in the most cunning move, Himmler appointed Rudolf Hess as the deputy commander to the SS and the deputy to Adolf Hitler as well. Certainly knowing how close Hess was to Hitler, this would put him in a solid position with a foot inside the big doors with the polished floors. Himmler was learning. And one would suspect it brought him much pride leading the first SS parade thereafter, with himself leading his black-led SS men as Hitler saluted them. And after a four-day event with much violence, several dead, and men hospitalized from the vicious street fighting in Munich, Himmler's SS men had held the line and gained the praise of Hitler. Himmler would write in his order of the day following his gratefulness to his men, promotions were drawn up, and he would personally handle even the smallest matter of paying local bills, transportation, or damaged equipment. He remained a stickler for detail and would remember them, and those who strayed from the rules and those who did not. It could be said, given the claims of corruption of the previous head of the SS, that young Himmler was the right choice for the position. Given his incorruptible nature, he would, in the years to come, expel and even imprison SS men for corruption, fraud, and any kind of improprieties. SS men and many others would be tried for excessive violence and mistreatment of prisoners, and later even three Gestapo men who had mistreated female prisoners would lose their lives for it. Himmler's journey is an interesting one to follow, especially in the years where his idealism must have been tested and blunted by the realities of war. On August 8, 1929, Maga gave birth to little Gulon. And over the years, as Himmler and Marga's relationship grew more and more into a routine friendship by all accounts, she would complain about gaining weight, eating disorders, confine herself to domestic chores and her tea parties with the wives of other party members. But Himmler adored his daughter, who would by some be labeled as a spoiled brat, but certainly not said to Himmler's face himself, as Karl Wolf would later testify, over the years, Himmler would call her and send her gifts from practically all theaters of war where he was, daily if possible. And to top off a good year for Himmler, he now obtained a small BMW open-top sports car, which he also loved. But his daughter came first. He would try to get her to write a diary, as his father had done with him. In 1941, Himmler would write in her album, in life, one must always be decent, brave, and kind. As it has become clear to me, and probably by now most of you, the life of Heinrich Himmler is not as clear-cut as one would imagine. To honor those who died during the Second World War, we must honestly and truthfully research and depict those who were involved in the leadership on all sides. And that's what I'm endeavoring to do. And as you have now also figured out, this will be a long and detailed series. Behind me is Vanna von Braun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebner's nuclear reactor. Over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow and share what I'm doing trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that are used for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, uh, my PayPal is there, protectionserviceint.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.